We welcome to the Only Fools and Horses podcast, Sarah Duncan. How's it going? Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. So you played the part of Lady Victoria in the episode Royal Flush. What are your memories of that time? Um, oh, lots and lots and lots. Um, I mean, as a as a experience, it was absolutely great. Uh, I mean, that there's so many stuff to do with it about the audition and then about the actual uh, shooting of the show itself. Lots and lots and lots of memories about that and how it worked out. And uh, very exciting it was too. So what was the audition process like? Well, the reason that it's particularly memorable for me is that when I was going for the audition, I'd been given a time, it was all slightly last minute, and uh, I'd done various interviews with the Beeb before. So I went off to, you know, and I thought, oh, yes, it's at the BBC and go off and do the audition. And so I went to where I'd always been, which was the wrong place. Uh, so I was very late. And uh, I remember sitting in the foyer really late um, at, and because I'd gone to the wrong place, at, uh, completely the wrong place. I mean, the wrong part of London for this audition. So I'd had to drive like a maniac um, to get across. I was about 45 minutes late and I sat in the foyer thinking, well, I've, I've blown it from the start. And while I'm waiting, I and it's the only time in my life this has ever, ever happened to me. I had the absolute certainty that I was going to get the role. Now, why I should have done, I have no idea, but I was completely convinced that I was going to get it. So although I was terribly late and it really should have made me completely flustered and awful, I was just totally relaxed because I was, I just knew it was like the sun had opened and it had sh shone down on me and it just sort of said, yeah, this is yours. And uh, fortunately, they were running late as well. So uh, it actually meant that I would have otherwise had, if I'd been on time, I would have had to wait for 45 minutes. As it was, I sat down, I had this moment of complete certainty that I was going to get the job and then was called up. It was great. It worked out really well. And then actually at the audition itself, so they'd got, um, John was there, uh, Tony Dow, who's the production manager, Ray Butt, um, those were the three people who were in at the uh, casting session and I read and John turned the other, to the others and said well I think we found our Victoria and obviously I was absolutely thrilled but I'd known that that was the situation you know so I was completely relaxed and that was fine and I went off and I was told Tony told me afterwards that he was absolutely furious with John absolutely furious because I was one of the first people they'd seen and he said you can't we've got two more days what the hell are we going to do you know you've already told this girl that she's got the role and what if someone better comes along or someone we think's more suitable or for whatever reason you've told you know you've said to her you've made her feel really great she's gone home thinking she's got the role and that's just such a, you know, really bad thing, you know, because there may well be someone who's better or we prefer or who works out. And uh, he said, you must never, ever say that of auditions, which he's quite right. You really shouldn't. And apparently there was someone else who came along who they thought was good. And they ummed and ahed for a bit. Was it going to be me or was it going to be her? And again, Tony was my source on this. He said, well, we decided that she was too beautiful. She'd never, ever go for Rodney. So um, I'm very pleased that I wasn't beautiful enough. So that was pretty good for me. He's quite a charmer, isn't he, Tony? I'm the quiet <laughs> Well, I know what he means. <laughs> I know they did say, um, Sarah, that uh, Liz Hurley, you know, Cassandra's part, they did yeah. consider Liz Hurley. And they said that about Liz Hurley, didn't they, that maybe... Well, they also, I mean, when they were doing it, they were thinking about the sort of person they were going to have. And I was told at the time that they were thinking about whether this was going to be the start of Rodney's relationship with someone else. But I think they'd made uh, Vicky so posh. She was so, you know, it just wasn't going to work out, which was a bit of a shame because otherwise I would have had the Cassandra role. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a very interesting relationship, isn't it? I mean, what was it like working with Nicholas Linter? So I think you're one of Rodney's more interesting girlfriends. Um, did you like their story? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was, um, I think it was always meant to be that it wasn't necessarily a romantic story. That it was, I suppose, two people who were slightly lost, slightly not quite certain where they were, wanting to perhaps be different things, but not quite certain what that different thing was. And I think... Um, I think that was always, I mean, there's a bit where uh, Rodney says, well, we're more mates than anything else. And mm. I think that was very true. And I think that there was that sort of sense of people who were getting on and it wasn't, wasn't ever really romantic. But maybe it could have been, who knows? But I, I think it was more, it was meant to be more of a, a, a meeting of minds rather than anything else. But they got on remarkably well, didn't they? Even though they're from two sides of the tracks, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. yes, I think that was that sort of... Well, I mean, of course, both of them had lost their mothers early on. So uh, I think that was sort of perhaps there. I don't know. But I think it was, it was never... You know, there was never a scene that was going to be the great romantic scene which ended up by being cut. You know, that was never something that we were going for it wasn't it wasn't that sort of romance no and what was it like working with Nick uh he was lovely really nice guy um terribly generous very kind uh at the time I'd done a lot of theatre work but not much television and um I remember he saying, oh, is there any way you'd like, you know, to rehearse, you know, would you want to do this? Or, you know, how, how do you like to work? And I'm thinking, well, I don't know, you know, we'll just go with the flow, really. Um, but I think he knew that I'd done a lot of theatre. So that was perhaps where he was coming from. But he was very generous. And I think that was a sort of very kind thing and to put me at my ease. And he never played the you know, the big star or anything like that. And yet you think he's been, you know, he'd been well known since he was in his teens. So, you know, he could have been very high highfalutin and grand, but he wasn't at all. Really nice person. Yeah, we always hear that, don't we, Chris? That they're always very laid back, very down to earth, aren't they, um, Sir David and Nicholas? Yeah, it's like a family, they say, don't they, the other actors, that they, they bring them into the family and make them feel welcome and relaxed. And they tweak things, Sarah, the, uh, some of the actors have said, you know, like David might say, well, let's do it like this. Or Nick might say, well, what, what if I look the other way? You know, they just tweak it slightly just to get that extra bit of funniness out of the scene. Well, I think um, certainly when I did it, that it was relative... Um, it was obviously, it was becoming an institution, but I don't think it was yet the institution that it became because I think I'm what, three years in? Three or four years in, something like that. It wasn't that well established. I'd never seen it before I was in it. That's the first, that's the first episode I ever watched was the one that I was in. So I had no idea who anybody was. I had no idea about the running jokes. Um, there's a bit where, in the opera scene, um, Rodney has a, Del puts a splodge of ice cream onto his white DJ. And I remember saying something about it to Nick and he said, oh, we do that. No one will ever mention it, but it'll be there. And, you know, the viewers will spot it and know that it's sort of there as a joke, but it won't ever be mentioned. No one, you know, they'll see it happen, mm. but, you know, Rodney won't. Del Boy went, nobody will talk about it. So, and then that's sort of a running joke that apparently they put in lots and lots of things like that. Because I was going, you've got ice cream on your jacket. Why, why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Or is there a joke? And he said, oh no, the joke is that no one will talk about it. And that's, and that's staying, Sarah. He's wearing that same dinner jacket in the last scene, isn't he? And I think you can see the ice cream stain on the jacket. I'm yeah, sure it never can. gets moved. It's always there. Mm, I think it's, yeah. it's sort of one of those things that there it is and there it is to stay. So, uh, yeah. Do you have a favourite scene at all? Because you did about, well, three or four separate scenes, didn't you? Do you have a favourite amongst those or? Oh, I did more than three or four. I did quite a lot. Um, 
the market, wasn't there? And then there was the car. The the market, and then there was the, the, the meal. market, the um, the shooting party, all the opera stuff, the shooting party, yes, as you've got at the, as your backdrop. Um, and the dinner. The shooting party, all the opera stuff, and then all the uh, the dinner party. Dinner party. Which is sort of after the shooting party, but I'm doing it in the order that they were filmed. So um, did, you, did you film it in that order, or was it filmed in a slightly different order to that? No, we started in we just started in Salisbury. So the first filming was around the market. Then the second lot of filming was um, in Salisbury, and that was where the exterior shooting party was. And then we did. Oh, no, we must have done the dinner party scene then as well. And we also did the foyer of the Opera House at that point. It was all rigged up in this. It, we took over this um, empty country mansion and they'd rigged up various uh, settings there. So it did have the grand staircase and the enormous dining room with the amazing table that sort of apparently opened out, you could seat about 50 people around this amazingly long table. Um, that was all sort of part of it. Um, but we also rigged up the, uh, the foyer of what was supposed to be Covent Garden, um, the bar there, and something else was rigged up. They had the kitchens there. Um, there was another scene that there was, they rigged up at that point. I know the Duke invited um, Dell into the study at the end when he sort of. So there must have been, in. that would have been. Hmm, I'm not sure that that was there. Mm. It seems likely it would have been, but I'm not 100% sure that it was. And then when we did all that, um, they were looking for they at that point they hadn't got anywhere fixed for where they were going to shoot the opera scenes um and in fact my at that time fiance um then later husband uh said why don't you go to buxton buxton opera house. i didn't know that he knew that but anyway he knew that buxton opera house was quite had the sort of the grandness of covent garden but was sort of smaller and scaled down. So we all, towards the end, we trooped off to um, Buxton and spent time filming there. So all the interior shots uh, were filmed up at Buxton. Oh, that's great you say, because we always wondered, didn't we, Chris, where it was filmed, mm. the opera scene? So it's filmed in, it's actually three places. So it's uh, where we arrive is the Theatre Royal Dr Drury Lane. Uh, so when you're in the Rolls Royce, Sarah, is it? So when, when we put... turn up in the Rolls yeah. and then go um, through, and that's the very last bit that's filmed, as from my point of view. That was the very, very last scene. Um, the So the foyer there and sort of down the stairs, that's the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Then the, um, the bar in the middle, when it's sort of the interval, um, where they meet... Uh, I can't remember her name, Diane Lane. Junie, Junie um, Diane Langton. Um, uh, that bit is all filmed in Salisbury. And then the interior is all Buxton Opera House. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, three different locations then. To make yeah. And then the actual filming of the, um, there's one shot, which actually, you said which is my favourite bit. And my favourite bit is going around in the rolls because <laughs> I was all dolled up to the nines. We were both dolled up to the nines and we've got this enormous car with a chauffeur. And um, because they wanted to film it sort of going past, we just drove around London and we kept on going round a roundabout and then coming back over the bridge and then round another roundabout and back over there. And they kept on, doing, oh no, we didn't quite get that one. So go past and go past at this speed and so on. And it was such fun. And um, I felt like going, like this, <laughs> like the queen, yeah. The roundabout <laughs> for the umpteenth time, um, because I've got. Well, you were royalty, to be fair, weren't you? You were it royalty. All, it was all great. It was really good fun. That bit. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I bet. But yeah, so um, I suppose we should mention Jack Headley. Unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year, didn't he? Did you did you did know? He? Jack? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, that's he did. A shame. Oh gosh, I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think he was um, 97 or something, but um, yeah, yeah. Did, did you have much to do with Jack? You obviously filmed a few scenes. 
yes, with him. I mean, he's he quite was, a seasoned he actor, was, isn't he? He was lovely. Um, he was a really nice guy. Did a few scenes. He was obviously hugely experienced as an actor, knew exactly what he was doing all the time. I mean, I asked him, you know, there I was completely, no idea what the programme was about, no idea who everybody was, um, not that much telly, and I just feel everyone looked after me, which was really nice. But he was very good. Um, you know, about sort of saying, oh, don't stand here, you know, you'll get a better shot if you're here and you know, move around to this side and it'll look better if you're like this. So that was really good. He was very experienced. He knew exactly what he was doing, which was a good thing because I didn't. And do people still recognise you as Lady Victoria? Have you had that many times? Yes. It's normally about two or three times a year, someone says, um, which I think is amazing. But people normally say it's, they hear my voice and they think, Oh, well, you mean Amy Fools and Horses? And uh, that's apparently it. I'm sure it's not the way I look because I look very different. I, it's like, you know, <clears throat> well, it's not quite 40 years ago, but um, 36, something like that. From but, my but your voice is very similar. I mean, if you think of some of the other actors and act actresses that have been in Only Fools and Horses, their voices are totally different, a bit like Sue Holderness. So she, she's very posh um, in real life. Uh, mm -hmm. But, of course, in Only Fools and Horses, she's the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I, th I think, obviously, you know, I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't that ma it wasn't a massive stretch for me to play the part. No. I read that Royal Flush as well, Sarah. I don't know if you had heard this, but they were still sort of editing it on the morning. Because it was on, filmed on Christmas, sorry, broadcast on Christmas Day. They were still editing it early hours of Christmas Day morning, you know. It must have been, was it close to Christmas when you were filming some of the yes, scenes? Yes, absolutely. Or? I mean, I think we started filming November, beginning of November, oh. something like that. And it was sort of six weeks altogether. The wow. script was written really late. Um, there were lots of things that were, um, it, it was, you know, work in progress. They didn't know how the ending was going to be. Um, they didn't know where it was going. Most most of it was fixed, but a lot of it, they didn't know what was happening. Um, there were things like, uh, so the Grand Country House where we were filming, as I said, it had all been sort of left and it was very, um, the exterior had this sort of lovely gravel area where you turned up with um, urns and foliage coming out of them. And it was all set up by the props people. And at uh, one point, I think Tony said to uh, Ray Bart, who's directing and producing, and he said, oh, when are we going to do the scene where we do the entrance? It's not on the schedule. And uh, Ray said, oh, I think we've cut it, haven't we? John was going to have a scene there. And then John was framed up and he said, oh, Yes, I was thinking of having a scene with as everyone arrived, but I think I don't think I wrote it. And uh, yeah. so the whole they'd rigged up this whole grand entrance with gravel turning circle for all the cars and things like this, with the pots and the statues and the thing to make the front of the house look really grand. Um, and it was all it was never filmed, never used. A bit awful. And yeah, I do you don't see the front of the part. house at all, do you, actually, really? You mm -hmm. don't see the front at all of the house. Sorry? You don't see the front of the house at all, actually, do no. we, in the, no, in the shot? Don't. No, Originally, you were going to see the front of the house and that it was this great big grand country mansion. But the grand country mansion hadn't actually come with its own driveway to it. Or if it had in the past, it had, it had gone. Um, so, yeah, the BBC had put it in. And um, I was told it cost thirty thousand pounds. Oh wow, that's a big hit. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, don't know if that's true, but apparently that's how much it was supposed to have cost to have um, made this huge driveway and to do it all. Seems rather a lot. Thinking mm. about mm. it, I've had work that's done. The hiring of the cars and things, maybe <laughs> as well. And I don't know. Maybe yeah. Um, I don't know. That's just what I was told at the time. And you're now an author, aren't you? Yep. Yes. Do lots of writing back in, fr in, in front of the computer. Very boring. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know you've appeared on Countdown a few times, haven't you, as well as in Dictionary Corner? 
Uh, no, not in Dictionary Corner. Oh, no. Oh, actually, the on the show. There's a competitor, yes. Competitor? Somewhere. I've got, a, I've got my teapot. I'm not sure where it is. Did I've, you win? I can't win teapot, there? which is, you know, one of my top prize possessions. Oh, so you won, did you, then? You won? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> is this the, the Carol Vorderman days or the more recent times? Carol Vorderman. Carol, Carol Vorderman, Vorderman days. days. Way back. Um, I had... Uh, so um, one of my girlfriends, um, this is, she was trying to raise money to have IVF um, because she was too old in the area that we were living in. And uh, she was raising money to have IVF. And so she was, she'd come up, hit on this idea, she would do game shows. So whenever she needed a partner, she got me to do the game show with her. So we did quite a few together. So we did things like Pointless, and there was um, one with Eamon Holmes that we did together and so on. And because it was fun, we both went up and auditioned for Countdown. Um, so we went together, for, I sort of gave her moral support and then we both got in and so on. So uh, that's sort of really why I started doing it um, and why I you know, did Countdown um, Pointless few other shows mm. usually with her did you keep anything from only fools and horses um well yes well i had scripts um but i sold them to the chap who runs the fan club oh, I, was, okay. I had them around the house and um, i was thinking well i'm sure there would be somebody else i had a period of my life where i did a lot of house moves mm. and and, um, you know, these boxes kept on coming with me. And I kept on thinking, I must get rid of stuff. I must get rid of stuff. And in the end, I thought, well, I don't know what to do with these. I'm sure somebody would love to have them. And um, so I got in touch with um, the Only Fools and Horses. Perry, isn't it? I think it's it's Perry. And um, said, I've got these. Do you think anyone, you know, at the society would be interested? And they were like, yeah, I would be. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So he's got those. But it's interesting. We've spoken to actors from Only Fools and Horses, and there were so many things they could have taken, but back then people didn't do it really, did they? Well, no. I mean, I think the one thing I would have liked to have taken, but I only ever saw it briefly anyway. It wasn't sort of something I had in my possession, and that was. Um, the mock-up picture of, there's right at the very beginning, there's a picture of me talking to Princess Anne. And they mocked oh, yeah. up this sort of image of me talking to Princess Anne. And obviously this was pre-Photoshop days. Mm. So it actually involved quite a lot of technical stuff. And I'd had to have a photo taken dressed up in riding gear, um, sort of talking to this person. They were trying to get me to sort of fit it in. So I had to do it at certain angles so that, they'd be able to manipulate the image. They'd get the right image that would sort of look as if I was talking to her. And um, I would quite, I think that would have been quite funny. And then they mocked it up into, I don't know, Horse and Hound or Riding Weekly or some magazine. And I think that would have been really funny to have kept. Yeah, um, very unique. Yes. Uh, but no, I, I don't think one did. Apart from anything else, I mean, it all belongs to the BBC. I mean, you can buy things. I mean, you, I mean, this has always been the same with filming and TV. You can you can buy the mm. outfit that you're wearing if you really like it. I mean, we were speaking it. to um, Fenton Stevens. He was in uh, one of the episodes. Um, mm. It's where Rodney becomes the where he goes on holiday and he has to pretend he's a fourteen year old and he he's the leader of the Groovy Gang and he gives him this badge. And it says groovy on it. And apparently there was a box of them left around and he just took them, didn't he, Chris? He did. I, I, was, I was thinking as well, um, Jumbo Mills. Uh, Nick yeah, Stringer that's probably well. the he best one. A, he had a wig, Sarah. So he, uh, Del pulled the wig off and he was bald and he kept the wig. And, and apparently that was that was thousands, wasn't it, Chris? Apparently. Mm. And he kept it and he wore it for years. But I suppose it was a personalised wig. They said that it's no one else, else is going to use it, you know. <laughs> so... Yeah. Normally stuff went to, I mean, you you went shopping with wardrobe. Um, 
I remember going going round at various sort of shops, but trying on clothes that I would never ever ever in, wear in a million years myself, and uh, sort of yeah, that was quite interesting. And you know, going shopping, and um, it it was yeah, um, but it all becomes part of the Beebs, you know, it's Beebs wardrobe, and it then goes back into their wardrobe, and they hang on to it, and so on. Um, and I think things like uh, the fur stole that I wore for the opera scene, um, that was some sort of lovely fur of some sort. And um, that was hard. So, you know, it wasn't as if stuff was there. And I think there was, I have a feeling, I think the dress I wore was hard. I think that in the opera scene, I think that came from Mosbros or somewhere like that. You know, it wasn't, and I, I'm sure the same is still true. You know, it's not just a free for all. And I mean, I did certainly at that time, I did lots and lots of ads and things like that. And all the wardrobe was either on sort of sale or return or, you know, you could buy it because um, mm. when my uh, first child was born, I did, um, I was in the bill and um, it was very, it was fortuitous. They wanted somebody who'd got a baby. And of course I came with a baby um, of the right sort of age who was reasonably together, but wasn't yet crawling so that they could, you know, basically could be put down and wouldn't scoot off. Um, and it was very nice because it meant I, I was able to act. I had uh, Nicholas with me and then um, he, had, he needed a chaperone because he was a child he was un under whatever the age is that you need a chaperone so my mum came so that was really nice we filmed on the bill but the um the wardrobe had got him some really nice little baby outfits and uh, to wear and i had those but i bought them you know it wasn't a, a gift but you bought them at cost oh, but <laughs> it would have been nice but i mean he had a whole set of very nice outfits that uh, he wouldn't have otherwise probably had I was going to ask you about the, you know, the Carmen scene, Sarah, was mm -hmm. the, the actors and actresses in that, were they in, in Carmen or were they just hired for the, for the scene as well? So, so the that. people who are singing, it's, um, I think it's English National Opera, is it? I think so, I think it's English National Opera who sing and the people who are in the audience, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, so they were, various people um i think the people of interest are there are three people who sort of say will you please be quiet or something similar mm. um one richenda carey is a lovely actress um the the second person who the man who turns around and says will you please be quiet uh, Del threatens was, him i think with violence really? doesn't he so Del threatens him with violence, I think, doesn't he? Yes, I think so. Well, he <laughs> is, um, he was uh, someone called Robert Herford, who um, was at that time the director of the Scarborough Theatre and uh, went on to have a huge success. He uh, adapted um, The Woman in White, which went on to become um, a Daniel Radcliffe film, but ran oh, yeah. a theatrical production for ages in London. Um, for him, and it's still been going on but um so he was uh, <laughs> hugely experienced but more as a director was than an actor although he'd started out as an actor and then the third person who says will you be quiet when um you don't actually see them and the reason you don't see them is because they were <laughs> they realized they hadn't actually got any but they hadn't cast anyone to do it so the person who's um who actually whose voice it is is the uh, assistant floor manager so really? it sounds, it sounds like a young one of the stage crew one of the crews actually is the person who says it because they haven't actually remembered to um call someone to do it of course and it must have, panic panic must have been panic must have been panic stations like you said november yeah i'm surprised it was november i thought you were going to say it was june july but i did hear that they were still editing it on the morning of christmas no they went right up they didn't know I mean, it's a bit like Casablanca. They didn't know who Ingrid Bergman was going to end up with. Um, <laughs> just like that, in fact. They, they didn't know how it was going to end. And I think that's why it's got a really, I won't say rushed 
ending. But the, end, the, the ending scene, I don't think John actually wrote it until the sort of the final week. I didn't think they knew quite how it was going to go. And they were they filmed that in the in the week before of Christmas in Christmas week, and it was edited right up to the day because I I think I finished I can't remember now Christmas was sort of like on a Saturday, and I think I must have finished on a Monday or a Tuesday, and they still had the final scenes to to film wow, and then edit. Wow, really? It was really really rushed at the end, and I think that's why, I, you know, I know a lot of people don't like it as. It's a controversial uh, one, and I think that's why I suspect that it would have had a little bit more finesse at the ending, or it he would have come up with a, I mean, I'm a writer now myself, mm. and I know that sometimes if you're pushed, you come up with sort of, not the obvious, but you could have come up with a better solution if you'd had a, more time to think, more time to mull it over, um, there'd been time for other input, you'd been able to see how other things were working, you could have gone back and, you know, set up other things up earlier, and so on. And I think that it, it isn't set up properly for him to sort of do that turnaround. And then, you know, how it, it, it finishes on a low note, rather than finishing on, you know, that great big, the punchline, it actually has a, a, it falls a bit flat, you know, Dell's a bit nasty, and then he gets a bit nastier. And you know it's it's a downer really, and it's yes. also not it's not helped by the fact that it's cut heavily for the DVD. So the original TV version that goes up, I think, is about fifteen minutes more, and there's lots of jokes which now, if you watch the DVD, it don't, doesn't make sense because they were cut from the original version. So there's stuff which goes nowhere because someone sets it up, but you haven't actually got the punchline or vice versa so it's a it's a real shame and i don't know why they don't restore it have the, have the original version it's is, is that when you say it's cut is it i know the opera scene's heavily cut is there other bits cut as well in the, mm. in the so there's there? lots of other things i mean there's things which are lovely jokes so there's one bit which was actually one of my favorite bits was at the dinner party scene and and del is um spreading peas all over the place and there's one bit which was completely cut. So he, I think we sort of see him eating and sort of being slightly messy. What gets cut is the fact that the, the very grand butler, who is Arnold Peters, oh, who's such a gentleman, um, so gracious and you know wonderful, he's walking along as this grand butler holding some tea tray or other. And he suddenly he looks down and he had quite a you know, aquiline, distinguished nose, I think we could say. And he sort of looks down his nose and it sort of it's captured this whole sort of expression. And you see his lovely shiny shoes and there are just peas everywhere on this carpet. And it's just such it's a small moment. But it is so funny because, you know, the expression of, you know, this very grand, you know, butler looking down his nose and then sort of realising and just the whole way it's been set up with Del, you know, eating peas. But you see him now, he's eating the peas and I think you still see the pea bit, but you don't see the punchline, which is the butler squelching on them on the peas. and seeing that his beautiful shiny shoes now are peed, as it were. <laughs> Um, and have all sort of green lumps on them. So that sort of thing got cut. Now, mm. it's still funny to see Del, Del mucking around with his food, but you don't get the joke. And there's a whole series of small things like that which were cut. And I, I just think it's it's terrible because there's lots of, of visual humour. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily, you know, the scripted punchline, but there are other bits and pieces like that which are cut, which is a real well, shame. It's interesting that because I don't know if you know that they've brought that episode um, and about four other episodes, Christmas once in the 80s, on Blu-ray. I was wondering if you'd seen it on Blu-ray. It's absolutely superb, the picture quality and sound. No, never. I've never seen anything on Blu-ray. No, I haven't. You know, have you, have you, I was going to ask you, have you seen the, have you re-watched the episode much over the years or... Well, occasionally I do. Um, mm. My children, 
so I've got two children. Um, certainly there was a period in their teens where they would, you know, drag people and they obviously had a conversation with somebody that went, oh yes, my mum was in Only Fools. And they were going, no, she wasn't. Yes, she was. No, she wasn't. And then they would be dragged back. And occasionally I would you know, be at home and suddenly I'd realise what's going on. That sounds familiar. And then I'd sort of <laughs> stick my head around the door and see me and so on. So, um, yes, that, that sort of... I don't think I've watched it. I've watched the DVD, I think, all the way through because I'd heard that it had been cut mm. quite a lot. Well, so the Blu-ray version, I think it's um, they've got two. They've got the the cut version and I think the restored version as well. So it'd be well worth watching. Yeah, and the picture it looked to me because it's thirty five years old. You said so. Yeah, it does look dated, but I think on Blu-ray now mm. it makes it look as though it's filmed last year. The picture quality is so good. You know, really good. Yeah. Well, I must admit, the only thing I, I mean, I think of when I watch it is I just think, gosh, I had so much hair. I mean, it's just like lots of hair. I mean, I always knew I had lots of hair, but when you've got it, when it's your hair, you don't sort of think of yourself as being, there's all this hair, but there it is, <laughs> lots of hair. <laughs> would, it, would it be a career highlight? Where would you rank it in your career, Sarah? Would it be near the top? Or... Oh, definitely career highlight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, t the top the top one yeah absolutely Brilliant. absolutely well I didn't work as an actress for very long I gave up after that that's that's my final swan song pretty much that was your, your retirement was it that one that was your last uh what a way to go what what a way to bow out I suppose <laughs> well it was slightly um when uh I had been thinking about did I really want to carry on with acting um, anyway? And then I got cast in Only Fools. And then I thought, well, there we go. I can finish now. And no one will say she left because she couldn't get work or she didn't get a decent part or she didn't do this. I thought, well, there we go. I'm going on my own terms. I'm sort of going to go now. <laughs> I, I would imagine with being in that as well, it would put it would give you many offers as well, I would imagine, wouldn't it? Really put you, you know, Prime time TV number one show would have been. I mean, I hmm, I like acting, still yeah. do. Well, I've never done. I haven't done it for years and years and years. I do like acting. Um, I don't like being an actor. Really, and, and it was not for me. I prefer being a bit anonymous. Yeah, yeah. Um, and an ordinary person. <laughs> doing, yeah, I, th I, think doing, I mean, I wouldn't want to be. Um, at the time, I mean, I can remember uh, David Jason telling me, you know, that sunglasses were really good because then you, if you walked around wearing sunglasses, you didn't have to meet people's eyes. And therefore, if you didn't meet people's eyes, you didn't, you know, they would want to stop you and talk to you, but it, you could sort of not see them. And I think that's, you know, is, is perfectly true, but it's not a particularly... You know, I can see that if you feel that you're constantly being looked at and... Want, people want you to respond when you're busy doing something else or in a hurry or whatever you know that's not necessarily or want to be private that's not great um I think uh Nick Lindhurst had had um a bit of a run-in with the press just before we were filming and I think he was a bit feeling a bit bruised and so on mm, there's nothing about being famous that's attractive and being an out of work actor is even less attractive so if you don't like it when it's successful and you don't like it when it's not successful then there's not much point in doing it is there 